Hello, everyone. My name is Bob DeGroote. I'm from the United States Geological Survey Earthquake Science Center. I'm based in Pasadena, California, and I work with the Shake Alert Project. And I'm really, really happy that you're all with us today. And we've had a wonderful group of folks plan this activity. We have representatives from across the Shake Alert team from the Washington Emergency Management Division, the Washington Geological Survey, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. And of course, we have all of you who have chosen to be with us today. Uh, you are the power behind Shake Alert, and you will have an important role in helping us improve not only the performance of Shake Alert across uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, but also you will help us with spreading the word about what's coming to Washington in May. That is the rollout of the public alerting to wireless devices. Uh, Oregon is actually rolling out in March, actually just in a couple of weeks. So just wanted to say thank you again for joining us today. We have a lot of things that are uh, you're going to learn today, lots of time for questions. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Jenny Crane from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Gabe Lotto with the University of Washington and the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and he's going to tell you a little bit about ShakeAlert. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yes, uh, Gabriel Lotto here at the University of Washington. I work on ShakeAlert Outreach, and I'm going to give you a briefing about what is the ShakeAlert system that you're all here for and what do you need to know. And after I go through that, we can uh, get into our main event, which is getting ready for this actual wireless emergency test message that's coming out. Um, and then, then there will be time at the end after the message for more questions, if, if you have any more questions on a shake alert itself. Next slide, please. So shake alert is an earthquake early warning system. What does that mean? Well, we detect earthquakes rapidly. We estimate how big the shaking is going to be and who is going to be affected. And then we send out that information so you can act on it. And this whole process really takes only a few seconds. So it's, it's quite miraculous. Uh, so I'll go into a little more detail here. So on the bottom left of this, of this graphic, you can see uh, an earthquake starting. So there's, a, there's an earthquake that starts on a fault underground. And the earthquake sends out uh, two main types of waves. The two types you have to worry about are the P wave and the S wave. The P wave travels faster. Uh, the S wave travels a little slower, but that's the wave that does most of the damage. So with the, when the P wave travels faster, uh, that means that we can record it on our network of sensors that are uh, laid out throughout the West Coast, throughout Washington, Oregon, and California. There's an integrated sensor network. They're distributed everywhere. It could be on schools or parkland or private property, but we've worked to, to get this array out there. And so wherever an earthquake starts, there's sensors ready to detect it pretty quickly. And now when those sensors feel shaken, they send that information automatically to a processing center. And when enough of these sensors feel shaking, we say, oh yeah, there's an earthquake. And we can rapidly estimate the, the size of that earthquake. We do a pretty good job of it too. And we send that information out for people and, uh, and organizations to use. Next slide, please. So here's the, the schematic. The process goes like this. First, like I mentioned, the detection and processing. That's all done by the US Geological Survey and its partners at the universities. Then with that information, we publish what's called a shake alert message. That shake alert message is then delivered by uh, separate distribution partners. That can be delivered to you, the individual, on your phone, or it can be delivered to organizations. That includes critical infrastructure, hospitals, schools, utilities, transportation networks. So when you get an alert uh, on your phone, you can get it from a variety of sources. Uh, it could be a dedicated app. It could be an operating system. It could be a wireless emergency alert message. And when an organization gets it, uh, they can take automated actions based on that, on that shake alert message. So uh, you can stop trains automatically. You can, you can open firehouse doors to prevent them being stuck. 
you can um, you can put out a message over a PA system protect, to protect the classroom of students. Next slide. So what happens if you get an alert or if you feel shaking? The simple message is you drop, cover, and hold on. So you get somewhere, uh, get low to the ground, you protect your head and neck, and you find cover and hold on to a secure object like a sturdy table. And this is not gonna work in all situations. So it's important to have situational awareness, right? If you're driving, you can't drop cover and hold on, but you can slow your vehicle, uh, get to the side of the road and cover your head and neck, right? Uh, depending on different situations though, drop cover and hold on. You only have a few seconds. So whether you get an alert in advance or you just feel the shaking before you get the alert, that's what you do. Uh, another thing to note in Washington, we have this tsunami risk if you're on the coast. So if you're in a tsunami prone area, after the shaking stops, you wanna start getting to high ground and staying there. Uh, you don't know for sure whether there's gonna be a tsunami or not when you feel an earthquake, but the shaking is your tsunami warning. And the stay at, you wanna stay at high ground because tsunami waves can last a while. Okay, next slide. Just a, a few last minute things to know about shake alert and, and we can go into more detail at the question and answer session. But basically there are some cases where you might feel shaking and not get an alert or get a delayed alert. It's because if you're standing right above where that shaking starts, you will receive you will feel shaking at the same time as our seismic sensors feel shaking. So there might be not enough time to process that and send it out to you. And there are also cases where you uh, might get an alert, but you might not feel strong shaking or any shaking at all. Again, there's lots of complications here. You could be in a different part of the ground below. You could be of a certain material property um, or the estimate might be slightly off. Uh, but these are some things that can happen. These are rare though. So you're likely uh, to have a, a successful shake alert message when you get one. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back to Jenny now and she's gonna take us through today's events. Well, thanks Gabe. So um, you may be wondering now, if now that you understand a little bit more about shake alert, how is it that you can get an alert in Washington? And so beginning in May of this year, mobile alerts will be available in Washington through a couple of different platforms. The first is Wireless Emergency Alert, or WIA. This is similar to um, an Amber Alert or an Extreme Weather Alert, which you've probably experienced on your phone before. Uh, the phone usually makes a distinctive warning sound and then a text pops up above other phone functions. So this is the function that is gonna be tested today. In addition to WIA, there's also um, alerting available through Android OS. Slides and there it goes um, through Android OS. So this is actually built into the operating system of newer Google phones. So this would be like a push notification that you received from your phone. And then in addition to that, there are purpose-built apps that have been designed specifically for delivering shake alert early warning. Um, so like for example, in California, there's MyShake. Um, at this point, none of them are um, delivering in Washington, but stay tuned because this is something that could come down the pike for Washingtonians. And this is something you could download from your app store and then have a third delivery uh, route to your phone. So, um, but be most aware of WIA because that's what we're testing today. And, and that's the one that's gonna be available to the most people. So this, uh, this date is chosen to test the um, shake alert on WIA because it's also the week of the anniversary of the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, which probably a lot of you remember if you were in this area in that year. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk in earthquake circles and earthquake education about the risk of the Cascadia megathrust earthquake, you know, the big one. And, you know, that's justified because that would be a very destructive event um, if it were to occur. But it's also important to remember that, you know, moderately sized earthquakes like the Nisqually earthquake are even more likely to recur in our, in our lifetime. And so it's importantly, important to be prepared for those as well. So shake alert provides people with extra seconds um, to prepare for imminent shaking and to get to a safe location, to drop cover and hold on. Um, and you can see from this photo at right that one of the biggest hazards, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest related to earthquakes is unreinforced masonry that has a tendency to just fall off the side of the building in an earthquake. And that you know, illustrates pretty graphically why it's actually safer to drop cover and hold on inside a building rather than try to run outside of the building and get risk, risk getting hit by some falling cinder blocks. 
So one of the things that we want to better understand about the WIA alerts is how they are received on different devices. If you've ever been in a room with a bunch of people when an Amber Alert is issued, you'll notice that like your phone might ping and then a few seconds later, someone else's phone pings. And then a few seconds after that, like 10 phones all go off at the same time. And when it comes to an Amber Alert, you know, that seconds of lag is not super important. But when it comes to shake alerts, seconds really do matter. We want to give people the maximum amount of time possible to protect themselves. And so we want to know, do some phones get the alert earlier or later? Do some phones not get the alert at all? And how does that vary from um, geographic location and from carrier to carrier and from phone type to phone type? So in a moment, we're going to send you off into breakout rooms where you'll have the opportunity to watch the test live and then provide some data about how um, you receive the alert. Uh, hi, everyone. Please uh, stick around if you like, if you have any questions. Um, I'm Bob DeGroote from the U.S. Geological Survey. If not, we encourage you to take the survey. Um, if you don't have the link, I think the link might have been put into the chat box, but I'll go ahead and do it again here. And please take the survey. If you didn't get to the alert, it's really important us, for us to know what happened because it'll allow us to make improvements. So like I said at the beginning, you're really going to help us impact um, the development of this service in Washington and actually throughout the West. So thank you. Any questions from anyone? I... Okay. <clears throat> if you're interested, Robert, yes, go ahead, please. Um, this is Kari Murphy with Girl Scouts of Western Washington. Hi. Um, I, we have a really wonderful emergency preparedness program called the Great Cascadia Zombie Survival Challenge. Um, and we've just started a program this year called the Science of Disaster. I'm wondering if I can reach out to you to maybe do a session during our November program. Um, our theme this year is um, architecture and engineering in disasters. Um, sure. And, and if, if I can't give that presentation, I know plenty of people who could do that presentation. Awesome. That could speak cool. to that, that idea. So, so let's get in touch and I'll, I'll get you connected. Okay, uh, and the second thing would be, um, is there a way for us to do a Girl Scout centric test like this? Um, since we're trying to get, um, we have like, I don't know, 17,000 members. Um, and I'm, we're, we're, what we're finding is if my, if my Girl Scouts are e-prep minded, um, they push their families <laughs> to become more um, emergency prepared. So just a thought. Um, and then I do have a sister council down in Oregon as well um, that would also probably be interested. That's a really good question. And one of the things that I would recommend is connecting your Girl Scout centric activity with the Great Shakeout on the third Thursday of October. Right, right. Which is this year, it's the 21st. Um, and there might be some plans to actually do a WIA type demonstration that day. Cool. But um, to do these sorts of things, it takes uh, quite a bit of coordination across a number of oh, different agencies to okay. make it happen. But we're really interested in your point about young people and the influence they have over old people like me to, to do the right thing and to do good things um, is, is, really, um, is really true. And so we want to encourage that. So, and also I see my colleague, Jenny Crane from OMSI is on the line as well. And Jenny's fantastic. And is working all kinds of on all kinds of programs. Uh, Earthquake Week uh, here, the week of the eighth of, of 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 March, right, Jenny? And um, so Carrie's from the Girl Scouts, and so um, she's also Jenny will will connect you with lots of great resources. But we have a lot available and lots of opportunities for engagement. So cool, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. We're really excited about working with you. So. Yeah, and we're, we're glad you're here. You know, we emailed a lot of folks, and um, so I appreciate that you were one of those that responded. And feel free to reach out to me if you want more educational resources for Girl Scouts or anything else. Um, there was someone in my breakout room who was just looking for more resources about earthquake preparedness in Washington and like, like where do I go to learn and to get to know for my family. So if there's some EMD folks and stuff on the line and want to drop some links in the chat, um, we can go ahead and start dumping them in for her, anyone else who might have that information. That's right. Yes, the best place to go in Washington, of course, would be to the Washington Emergency Management Division. 
um, if you had the link mil.wa.gov as the um, there should be other links to pages in that at that link to other parts of, of Washington's Mercy Management Division resources for preparedness. So cool. Anybody have any questions, any comments? You know, I know some of you didn't get an alert. I know it's like, oh man. But you know what? You're really, you really helped us out today. So it means a lot. So thank you for your time. I know that you, there's a lot going on in everyone's lives these days, but uh, spending some time with us was, was really important. I have a question. Yes. My, uh, my wife was sitting right next to me and I've got, I got a notification at 19 minutes past 11 and she didn't get it till two minutes later. Do you have any idea why that would be? <clears throat> there are a lot of factors and we have to, if, when you fill out the survey, we might be able to get to the bottom of some of them. It could have something to do with the cell phone provider. It could have something to do with a, the phone itself, likely cell phone provider. Um, there are ho a whole host of factors involved. In fact, that's one of our, our goals here is that if we know if people are receiving the alerts really late, um, we can actually do some, some sort of back work on it to find out what happened. So please do the survey and say that. When, so you said you got it 19 minutes after the hour and she got it 20 minutes. I got it 19 seconds after the 19 hour. 19 seconds. You said seconds. And she, and she got it uh, two minutes and 16 seconds after the hour. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's try to figure that out. You both have the same cell phone provider. Don't want to, yes. yeah, don't want to, uh, to uh, get into your private life there, but um, that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting question that we need to resolve. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that I think that's important is that, and Jenny spoke to this early on during the discussion today, is that you, one of our philosophies within ShakeAlert is for, for, to get your alert through as many pathways as possible. So if you have your WIA alerts enabled, if you have, if you have an Android phone, you get Android alerts through Google, from Google. Um, if you have, there's a dedicated app and there will be dedicated apps coming to Washington, having um, multiple pathways is important. And guess what? You may be somewhere at work or at school or wherever, and you may get an alert over the PA system or something else may happen. You might be on, on the train and it might slow down and, and there might be an announcement. I mean, these are all things that are coming in the future. And that's actually one of the things that we're really focused on um, once these rollouts are finished in May is to really focus on more automated actions, getting shake alert into systems that do things without people actually getting involved. And that could be slowing down trains, opening firehouse doors. We recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the San Fernando earthquake back in 1971. And one of the reasons why certain vehicles weren't able to get out of the, uh, fire vehicles weren't able to get out of the firehouse is because the earthquake had shifted the building and they couldn't open the door. So that's one of the safety features. And I grew up across the street from a fire station and I grew up in Altadena, California here in the Southland. And I remember every time there was an earthquake, the firehouse doors always opened. And just as a, as a precaution in case a bigger shaking was coming. And I always wondered why that happened, but now I know. So any other questions? Anyone want to add anything? Any of my colleagues, I see Mariah out there and I see Harold and all our yeah. great friends from different places. Go ahead. Bob, I got a couple of really good questions um, that I think would be good to open up discussion in this space uh, for, but one was about um, how earthquakes happen in a lot of different places. Um, one of the people in my breakout group mentioned uh, experiencing an earthquake in Gainesville, Ohio, and how um, when they were growing up, uh, similar to when I was growing up, uh, we're told to get in a door frame <laughs> uh, for protection at, and not to get under furniture. So uh, why do we use drop cover hold on? Um, and yeah, because that's a very common common myth around uh, what protective actions to take. Uh, yeah, that was the first. Sure. Well, um, well I, I've been talking a lot. Uh, do any of my colleagues want to take that on? I have some 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 background information about the door frame part, although I know that there are different versions of the story. Um, but I'd like to open it up to any of my colleagues. I see Bill Steele out there from the University of Washington, Gabe Lotto from the University of Washington, Harold Tobin from the University of Washington, and others. Uh, anyone want to want to go ahead and take that on? Or if anybody in the audience anybody in the audience has a question, feel free to ask those questions as well. Or you might have an answer to those questions. Why drop cover and hold on? Why do you think that that's a great way of handling? You start feeling well, shaky. Let me jump in on that, and that is that. 
Uh, we find that in Washington state in 1965 and in the 1949 earthquake, there were numerous deaths from people running out of buildings and having bricks and other material fall on their heads from the building. Also, when you're trying to move, if the ground is shaking hard, you're likely to be knocked off your feet and you could break a hip or a leg or have some other injury that prevents you from then protecting yourself further during the earthquake. So we really encourage people to drop cover and hold on or do what do something to protect yourself in the environment you're in. If you're in a wheelchair, that might be locking the wheels and covering your head and riding through the earthquake that way. If you're on, in bed, it might be just putting a pillow over your head and staying in bed and riding out the earthquake there. But whatever it is, the main object until the shaking stops is protect yourself and then take care of your loved ones and then take care of uh, checking your home and your environment for it to see if it's still safe. Can I add uh, something to, to the mix too? I was uh, in the Nisqually earthquake on the second floor of my house. There was no furniture at the time. And the, the quake was so strong, it knocked me off my feet. And I could not get up for like 45 seconds during that, that shake and roll. So there you have it. <laughs> All I could do in that case was to try and crawl to the furthest wall uh, away from the windows and cover my head. So that's what I had to do. So an earthquake early warning would be really helpful to give you that extra few seconds to find that safe place before yes. the shaking begins. Yes. I, I just wanted to note in the in the chat box, I put in a link to earthquakecountry.org and the step five is drop, cover, and hold on. And although this 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 document was was originally produced in Southern California, it actually provides some really good advice about if you're in bed or if you're in a theater or if you're driving. So the drop, cover, and hold on instructions is actually sort of generalized for protecting yourself, making yourself a small target, knowing where you are and what you can do. There might be might be something, there might be nothing to get under. Um, now that, and again, I, there might be someone here that can confirm or deny this story, but the, but I know that in in this particular publication uh, uh, called "Putting Down Roots in Earthquake Country," there's a story about why get in a doorway, and then there was a time when the doorway was one of the strongest parts of a structure, and especially if structures were built out of things like adobe, and uh, the rest of the structure would collapse, would shatter mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and that, that doorway would provide um, protection. Um, of course, that's no longer the case with most construction. And uh, so the dropping, covering and holding on is what we say. But, you know, I'll tell you, you know, that's what I was taught when I was a kid and I was in elementary school and I actually did that. Um, I got under a doorway during the Northridge earthquake in 1994 um, because that's what I always knew. So actually, that's the important part, practicing drop, cover, and hold on, practicing, practice, practice. Get that information in your heads in such a way that you do it without thinking. You know, you don't think about when you tie your shoe about every single step, but um, you actually can, can do it without thinking and protecting yourself. Anyway, I've been talking a lot, so I want to open it up to my colleagues. I know Jenny, Jenny's smiling at me. Do you want to do that? Well, I, so I'll, I'll just say one thing, and then I see some um, great questions in the chat that I think we should address. Um, and, it, you know, in response to a lot of the folks saying, you know, I, I didn't get the alert, I got the alert late, like, is this even going to work? I just want to reiterate that this is, shake alert is just one tool in your earthquake preparedness toolbox. Like, like, ultimately, you know, you're responsible for making sure that there's places that you can drop cover and hold on in your house and that there aren't, you know, unsecured stuff on your walls and, you um, and, you know, this, this system is constantly improving, and we hope that we can reach as many people as possible with as much time as possible. But, you know, the reality of the system is, is that not everybody is going to get an alert that um, gives them advance notice. And so just having your own preparedness plan um, is going to be really important. Um, so, yeah, I see one question. I, I live near Lake Sammamish. Is it true that there could be a tsunami on the lake? Um, I grew up near Lake Sammamish and I am very curious about that. So maybe some of the seismologists can tell us. Jump in if you like. Um, so, you know, uh, as somebody put it in the chat, there are, some, there are different subtle things in the lakes. Um, we're, we're unlikely to have an actual tsunami, but there is the possibility of the shaking causing something like bathtub sloshing that happens in lake that's called a seiche. And it can be very dangerous because it can move a lot of water <clears throat> to the margins of the lake. So, 
in the same way as with a tsunami, if you experience a strong earthquake at all and you're very close to the water level, it's important after the shaking is over and you feel safe to move away from the water line and move uphill if you possibly can. Um, an earthquake on the Seattle Fault uh, or one of the other crustal faults in our region could potentially produce a localized tsunami in the sound, um, uh, in the Puget Sound. So uh, that's also a possibility. Uh, and those would also come relatively quickly after the earthquake because the faults are right underneath the area. Um, a tsunami from the Pacific Ocean could travel up the Straits of Juan de Fuca and into the sound, but that would take a very long time, like one to two hours. And we would probably have a significant amount of good advance warning for all of that. And it's unlikely to be very large. That's sort of the whole Seish plus tsunami story for the region. And house, people who live in houseboats should also think about what the, what the security measures are for their boats for, for those circumstances as well. Is it all right for me to speak right now or do you want to say some more? Uh, Paul, Mr. Tor Treben. Have you finished, uh, Mr. Tobin? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. okay. My name is Richard. I'm from Seattle. What I've noticed is the only survivors of this earthquake will be the people at this chat group or this uh, the Zoom meeting, because everybody else doesn't really care. I mean, if it doesn't happen frequently, like say once a month, it's not it's not part of their planning. And so, as a possibility, the, is do you have a budget that? goes in for uh, putting in ads in the uh, in on TV the radio to remind people once a month hey this is for real we, people are going to die who are not prepared so you know that's that's you know it's I, I, I was on a committee the safety committee for the postal service and uh, I was the I represented the president of, the, of my union and I it took me 10 years just to get uh, the management to initiate a drop and cover drill. 10 full years, they said, earthquakes don't happen here. Most of the management were, were from out of state. So they didn't believe Seattle could have possibly have an earthquake. And by the way, some of them were for, from California who were actually in an earthquake. Mm -hmm. It says, you, Seattle does not have earthquakes. And then, you know, until I pushed through that uh, initiative, but it was after the, the Nisqually quake that we initiated it. Yeah, you bring up a really important, you know, challenge, which is keeping people aware. And Nisqually was now 20 years ago, <clears throat> coming up on Sunday. And that means that, uh, you know, I teach at UW, right? So that means some, my students mostly weren't born yet or certainly aren't old enough to remember uh, in the vast majority of cases. It's been a long time since we had a damaging earthquake in the region. Um, we don't have, let's say, a specific budget to do what you said and put an ad every month in the paper. But there is continuous preparedness information from the state emergency management folks. Every time we have a relatively um, minor, fortunately, earthquake in our region that, you know, it'll shake some people, wake them up. Um, we do our best to be available to media. We get asked to do news stories literally almost weekly these days. Uh, and so we can, um, uh, we can, you know, we, we, have a, we take every opportunity we can to use all those teachable moments to remind people. And I am optimistic about one aspect, which is which is that our kids in school are doing earthquake drills now. And more and more, I think it's the young folks who know exactly what to do. And, and you know, there's plenty of good examples. Um, recent one from uh, the Alaska earthquake two years ago where they jump under the table so fast, you can't even believe it. Uh, so there are, there are, I think, a lot of good signs. I think the awareness is high, but our job is to keep promoting that awareness all the time. And by the way, since I didn't introduce myself, I'm Harold Tobin. I'm the director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network and a professor at UW um, and work on these seismological problems. And we partner with the US Geological Survey on the actual seismic detection system, seismic network and shake alert. Uh, does anybody know uh, whether or not, uh, well, Seattle, there was an article in the Seattle Times, uh, oh, I'd say last year, and uh, I forgot exactly which month, but they said the Seattle water supply would be shut off for about two months because all the pumps are electric and they and they expect them all not to be functioning so as far as preparedness goes I, I survival water would be the first first item on the agenda right after the earthquake 
Does, does anybody know anything about that? If they plan to Bill Steele be jump in here. Yeah, let me jump in there a little bit. Oh, First of all, the, the Seattle water system is primarily gravity fed from two different sources, north and south. So there's some redundancy built in there and not dependent on pumps per se. The sewer, some of the sewer systems are, but uh, that's important as well. Um, there are vulnerabilities in the water system. And one of the things, one of the early uses of shake alert by utilities have been to, uh, to protect reservoirs, to close valves on certain backup systems so that we can open them later after the earthquake um, and, and uh, broken water mains will not drain the system completely and we'll still have water for firefighting and drinking afterwards. Um, Seattle hasn't adopted this yet. We're, we're looking forward to the time that they, they do explore that more, but we're making good progress in that arena of using ShakeAlert to help uh, in those last seconds prepare utilities to ride through the earthquake in a safer manner. It's not perfect, but it's something. I could jump in for a second here too. Oh, sorry, this is Brian Terwitz for the Washington Emergency Management Division. Uh, we work very closely with Pacific Northwest Seismic Network on uh, understanding earthquake hazard and making sure that people do. So Richard, I appreciate that you are trying to bring attention to this issue because it is a huge problem in the area and especially water. Uh, we ran the Cascadia Rising exercise in 2016 where we simulated that this earthquake happened, the Cascadia subduction zone. One of the biggest things that came out of that is it will take a lot of time for everyone to have the resources and infrastructure that they need. People will be coming to help you, but it's going to take time. So personal preparedness, that is why we shifted this message from three days of preparedness to two weeks. It sounds daunting, but it is something people can do. Um, this earthquake early warning to prepare things, this shake alert system, we're really looking forward to it, but it is only part of the solution. We really need to make sure that individuals at localities, cities, and uh, utility providers work to mitigate the earthquake hazard, hardening their systems, like is being done with ShakeAlert, um, to make sure that that fresh water supply is available. But this is also going to take uh, reinforcing buildings so that they don't collapse, specifically unreinforced in that case. But DOT has spent millions on making sure bridges will stay up so that resources can be brought in. And this is a huge conversation. I don't want to draw away from it. But the point is, if you're aware of this and you're trying to bring attention to it, doing it because it is way too big for any one organization to do on their own. So thank you for that. Thank you for your concern with that. Um, it looks like Tom Wolf had his hand raised for quite a while, if he had a question. Thank you. Um, I uh, did not receive the alert. I've got an iPhone and wanted to know how I can be able to double check to make sure I had it activated properly. Mm. I, I'll, I'll jump in. So as far as actual phone settings go, I think your best resource is probably the Apple people. Um, if you were to go to the Apple store or get on customer service, like they're the ones who can tell you about your phone more than, than we can. Um, so it, so it, the reason for not giving an alert, it could have to do with your phone or it could have to do with some other step earlier in the process, which is why we are doing these tests to try to troubleshoot these things. But um, yeah, Bob, did you want to add to that at all? Well, you have a great answer, knows. Jenny. Thank you. Right. Will the alert come through if your phone is on mute or turned off? Yes, it should. Not if your phone Hold is on, muted. not if it's not turned if it's off. off. Oh, yeah. not if it's turned off. No. Mine was muted and the alert came through fine, although it didn't make an audible sound except for the vibration. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to touch on Richard and Harold's comments regarding um, preparedness and getting people's attention. I, I work in natural hazards with USGS doing a lot of flooding type of work and what we found is that we really needed to be prepared with the preparedness message after the teachable moment occurs and so people may not listen to you about being prepared um, but when something does happen that gets their attention you need to have your message prepared and ready to roll out for the next one. 
Thank you so much, Joseph. This is uh, Sarah McBride. I'm a social scientist with the USGS. We actually have, we had a whole project on developing post alert messaging so that we actually have all of that ready to go. I have a paper, an academic paper on it. Um, Brian Terbush and Dr. DeGroote and so many of my colleagues on the phone call were co-authors on this. So we absolutely agree with you. That is such an important finding that you need to be ready as soon as the alert goes out to talk more about the alert and more about preparedness information. <laughs> And about aftershocks. So, yes, completely on the same page there. Thank you. Do you work with Office of Communications on this at all? And can you share that with me at my work email, jljones at usgs.gov? We do work with OCAP. And OCAP, actually, Paul Austin, who is with OCAP, was one of our co-authors on that paper. So absolutely awesome. happy to share it with you. Thank you. What does the severity of the earthquake have to be for an alert to go out? For this, uh, for this, for a WIA alert to be to be distributed, a Shigler powered WIA alert, uh, it would be for earthquakes of uh, or magnitude five or greater, and alerts would be delivered to people who could feel weak shaking or or greater. So that would be. Um, MMI or modified Mercalli intensity three or greater. So those are those are the sorts of people that would get, get alerts in those cases. And the, it's different uh, thresholds for different applications, um, but for WIA specifically, it's magnitude five and anybody who would feel um, sort of the weak to light shaking or greater. So does the alert come out with an aftershock? Or does the aftershock have to be over five? Uh, the any event that any event that that you would that an alert would be distributed would be at, um, would be at magnitude five or greater. Thank you. And I misspoke. Er, and I and I misspoke earlier. Sorry. Just just to clarify, to correct my my statement. It's uh, delivery of alerts would be to those who would feel um, MMI four uh, light shaking or greater. Sorry about that. I want to make sure the folks who have had their hands raised in the in the chat get a chance to talk. So I think next is Jessica Yellen. Okay, I think I unmuted myself. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, the first one was a bit more general. Uh, what if you're driving on, say, the 520 bridge or one of the multiple bridges in the Seattle area that is uh, seismically compromised and hasn't gotten, um, you know, is it better to like gun your car and try to get away? Um, what if you're stuck in traffic? What do you do? So that was the first question. The second question is, um, in the in the Nisqually quake, I live along Fortin Creek. Um, there was enough movement there to both break a water main um, on my next to, adjacent to my property, and also the creek bed uh, changed. I mean, it it really um, changed elevation quite a bit, and the big bulkhead on the where it went over the road uh, pulled away about two feet. Um, when I talked about this to some colleagues at work, one of them was a PhD student in, in geology, and she just laughed and said, well, creeks are on fault lines, pulled out a map and showed me the fault lines. Um, is that something that I should be, is, first of all, is that correct, that if you are on a fault line, you are going to feel more of the earthquake than if you were sort of further away from a fault line? And then second of all, uh, what should I do in, in my house or where I live to, to sort of help with that? There's a lot to unpack there, Jessica. Let me just comment about the bridges and the 520 bridge. That actual bridge is being re-engineered and with deep pilings to, to make it more seismically resistant, much more than the earlier floating bridge. I think in general, um, trying to outrun an earthquake is kind of a futile task and at high speed, any break in the roadway or separation of a joint uh, could cause you some serious problems. So uh, I recommend that you pull over, put your flashers on, put your blinker on and pull over when it's safe and ride the earthquake out that way and then, then cautiously proceed after that and make sure you understand that the road could be disturbed. I'm gonna leave the comment about the geology of, of uh, riparian corridors to, to someone else. Thank you. <laughs> Why? Can you help? 
Megan? Does it look like we have any takers on the right well, I'll jump in if you want. I mean, yeah, yeah the, the answer is sort of it's complicated, meaning that, okay, first of all, yes, there are creeks that follow known fault, fault lines and ones that don't, um, many more that don't. Um, but secondly, that um, the, the severity of shaking you experience doesn't necessarily correlate to being directly above an actual fault or in particular the actual fault that slipped or not. All other things being equal, yeah, being close to the epicenter of earthquake is worse than being further away. But as we've seen, many different things affect actually where the shaking is strongest and, and versus less strong. So, so you kind of, I mean, if you're directly at a place where there's a ground rupture in an earthquake, that's not a good place for your structure to be built. Um, but the shaking won't be that different there than 100 yards away or 500 yards away or 1,000 yards away. So that's, that's kind of um, maybe a, a brief answer to that. I would say the other part about uh, if you're on a creek or anything, though, is enhanced liquefaction hazard. Um, pretty much any area that's wet, you're going to have an increased chance that the, the ground is going to uh, shake a little bit harder, some amplification from the loose sediment there. Um, and in addition, for your first question, um, whether you're on a driving or whether you're in your home, um, while EMD, we worked with IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, to kind of create an animation of the, the best what to do in different situations. So that's there in the chat, uh, what to do in different situations in an earthquake. Resource available if you want. Can we check that out? Good one. Uh, I Harold, think we, Harold and Bill, would, would you not agree that alluvial sediments are gonna in general be more susceptible to liquefaction? Yes, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but and also landsliding if there's a, some like Thornton Creek has some very steep slopes leading down because the the creek is cut cut into the uh, terrain quite deeply, and that can be prone to landsliding as well. So there are multiple hazards close to a a, a, a canyon creek like that. I think we also have a question from Jeffrey Culver. Yeah, hopefully yeah, this is working. Yes, uh, hello all. Yeah, I've uh, got a, um, I'm a uh, amateur radio volunteer with Medical Services Emergency Communications here in Western Washington. So what we do is we staff uh, radios in, uh, in hospitals uh, in the event of earthquakes or other disasters. Uh, one question I had was I, I did get the alert on my iPhone uh, as a text message, it looked like. But when I tapped on it, I was unable to open it. I don't know if there's any detailed information that would have shown up. And the comment is uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, being in vehicles on during earthquake. Uh, I had, uh, besides the 1965 earthquake here in Seattle, I was uh, stopped at an intersection on a traffic light on my motorcycle in Santa Barbara. This was about 1978, 79 when an earthquake hit, you know, just bang. Uh, it was, I could see shock waves going through the surface of the palm trees were swaying like there was a breeze and I just, I could not hold up the motorcycle that had to lay down. So I'm just glad I was not moving when that happened. That would have been probably an interesting ride. So. Yeah, talk about off-roading, right? And um, did, did anyone have a response to that before I call on Claudia? Well, I would ask um, Jeffrey, um, do you have, with your uh, shortwave network, a way to interface with the shake alert? Uh, no, we, we do not. We, we would have to, um, uh, we're using, we're, we're not really using HF, which you, we, uh, high frequency, which is primarily shortwave. We're using VHF and uh, UHF uh, uh, line of sight communications through repeaters, but we do not have an alert through our radio system. We would be uh, relying on the, uh, 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 getting alerts from uh, the uh, Met Washington uh, Emergency Services. Thank you. And Claudia. Hi, everyone. So um, the the first thing is, uh, I think I'm following up uh, with a question that got asked a few minutes ago about not receiving the alert. I did not receive the alert again. Um, what is the expectation? Should it have been an alert, like an Amber Alert, basically? is uh, That's what it would have been like? Okay. Sounds mm -hmm. good. I'll, I'll check on the settings on my phone. I mean, I know I got an Amber Alert yesterday, but I'm not sure why I didn't get this one. I was pretty excited for it. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so bummed for you that uh, I know everyone, if you're nerdy enough to sign up for this call, then you're probably nerdy enough to enjoy getting a, <laughs> you know, yeah. a test alert. Um, and I think one of the big things is that, you know, pretty much all phones are set to receive WIA, but different phones capacity to receive tests. It just varies from phone to phone, um, and there's a lot of variation. So, all right. Well, uh, hopefully, whatever it was gets uh, resolved. Then, anyways, thank you. And thank you so much yeah. for being here. And Claudia and anyone else on this phone call, if you did not receive an alert, we but you signed up for the test, we still want to hear from you. It is just as important for us to know who did not get an alert as it is the people who did get an alert and when they received it. So please fill out the survey in the link that was provided in the chat. Um, that really helps us out. Thank you so much. Yeah, we absolutely, I'll just reflect back on what Sarah said and just reiterate that we absolutely do want to test out that information and, and make sure that everyone who should have received an alert, you know, does in the future. And Sarah has been really hard at work you know, testing these things and, and she's our head sociologist who's really looking um, at all of these things. And I've, and I've been doing all of the geocoding and looking to make sure that our geofences have been holding and from our tests in California as well. So please, we wanna hear from you. I think we have a question from Ricky Garcia. In terms of uh, preparedness, uh, given the, I mean, what would what would, be, what would be the suggestion? I mean, I've heard many people talk about a seven day supply of food and water. Others talk about like the whole city being shut down for a month or two months of a Cascadia kind of subduction zone earthquake does occur. Um, what is what would be a safe bet uh, in terms of, you know, preparing with food, water, um, emergency kits? I mean, what 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 would that look like? Don't mind if I take this one at Washington Emergency Management Division. Our, our recommendation is two weeks ready for the entire state. You want to have 14 days of food and water. However, it's going to be more important to look to your local emergency management agency um, because they have things designed to your, uh, your specific area and what your needs are. So again, that sounds like a lot. I'm going to post the um, in, in chat again our... Uh, we recently just released a prepare in a year guide, which is just a little bit you can do about two hours of work a month to actually make sure that you are much more prepared for earthquakes. So we want to get this resource out there as much as possible. But again, 14 days is our recommendation. And that's based on the assumption and the understanding of just how devastating a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake would be. People will be coming for you with resources, but really you and your neighbors are going to be the first responders for your immediate area. You can totally survive this. Just get prepared now. I'll post that link in the chat. I ha also highly recommend for anyone who's interested in learning more about uh, community emergency response teams, it's called CERT, C-E-R-T, to look up your local CERT in your area. Um, I happen to teach it here at Woodenville High School. And it's an invaluable class that will give you the skills that you need to safely and properly help out in an emergency or a disaster and really fill that gap between when something happens and when the emergency services personnel will arrive on the site. And adding to that and your Map Your Neighborhood program that was actually started by the state of Washington and is now a national program is very important to know to work with your neighbors, know your neighbors and be able to respond as a neighborhood in a disaster. One other tip that might be useful in a lot of ways is uh, having a, a water filter set up to augment the water that you set aside for that 14 days of water is a lot of water. And it's likely if there are water main breaks, you're gonna to have to boil water and you may not have gas to do that. You may not have electricity to do that. So having a good passive water filter uh, handy is great for camping. And it's also great to augment your water supply. Yeah, remember that water is not just for drinking uh, and for cooking and things like that. It's also your hygiene. Um, if you're stuck for 14 days, you're gonna to wanna to brush your teeth once in a while or something like that. Think of it as just camping indoors for a long period of time and be prepared for that. 
Yeah, we have a lot of resources on our mil.wa.gov slash preparedness, but again, please go to your local emergency management page for uh, augmented more local resources on what they recommend for being prepared. There's some places on the coast that know they have a tsunami hazard. They recommend 30 days of preparedness. So we think they're overachievers, but it's realistic. So, May I ask another question? Yeah. Can see why not? Uh, I have been noticing, I mean, I keep, uh, I, I have uh, this notification uh, that I, this, this group that I follow on Facebook in terms of like earthquakes and stuff like that. Um, and the reason being is because I was in this huge earthquake when I used to live in uh, Mexico City, uh, which was pretty catastrophic. Um, anyways, I have noticed that there had been like a, 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 a lot of uh, little minor earthquakes along the coast, Vancouver Island. There was a, a recent one off the coast of, uh, of Washington in the Pacific Ocean. Um, is that any indication that any big earthquake is coming? I mean, in terms of predicting something like this, I know it's extremely difficult, but is there some form of pattern, something that uh, we should be on the lookout for? I can tackle that if you guys like. Um, the short answer is no. Nothing that we're seeing right now is a pattern that indicates the imminence of some larger event. Um, I will hasten to add to that that, you know, in the long range, we know about the earthquake hazard. And so there are sort of probability statements, long-term forecasting of what the likelihood of an earthquake is. And, you know, the chances at any given moment are, are not high, but um, the preparedness is necessary because we don't have that way of short-term forecasting. There's no science that we've got that tells us that seeing some particular uh, set of things that we're experiencing, whether that's the stuff you hear about with what's called tremor, which I hate the word because it makes it sound like just lots of earthquakes and it's actually kind of a slightly different phenomenon. Um, that gets reported on the news sometimes, um, or slow slip events, or the offshore earthquakes that we see very frequently. Um, none of them that have shown us any signs now that there's imminence to a larger earthquake. The sort of um, probability statement about a Cascadia subduction zone, you know, very large earthquake and potential tsunami is on the order of 15% um, chance in the next 50 years. The probability of an earthquake like Nisqually happening again is estimated as something like 85% chance in the next 50 years, meaning we're much more likely to see a Nisqually event recur and something similar than, than necessarily to have a larger earthquake. The Seattle Fault, uh, Tacoma Fault, Whidbey Island, et cetera, are also rated as lowish, but very much not insignificant probability at around 15% in 50 years or so. So the, the message is preparedness, not freaking out, because even in very large earthquakes, the vast majority of people survive them and come through reasonably okay, even if um, the structures around them are damaged and so on. These, these preparedness steps are really important because I, I sometimes hear people sort of express the opinion that, well, it's coming and we don't know when, so we're all going to go sort of thing. And, and that's just really, I, I don't see that as, as useful at all. Um, we've seen it around the world. Big earthquakes happen and most people get through them. And we want to make sure that we incur, you know, we increase our chances of getting through them as well as we possibly can. But yeah, we're, if, if we ever see a thing where we think the science shows that an earthquake is somehow imminent, and as I said, we don't have a mechanism for that, we would certainly be taking the appropriate steps just as we do when the volcano hazard goes up. Um, but volcanoes actually do show us signs typically that they're likely to erupt soon and earthquakes are really different. Well, you make I'm gonna a great jump, point, I'm gonna jump Carol. Real quick. Is that okay, Joseph? Um, I'm jumping real quick just to say that we're gonna, um, we'll do a hard stop at 12, but between now and then, feel free to keep asking questions. I'm enjoying this conversation a lot. We'll try to get to the ones in the chat. We'll try to get to everybody, but we'll also um, send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered at the email they address they registered at with, um, some additional information linked to, um, if, I'm not sure if we'll have a recording available, but link to all some more information to answer your continued questions if you have any. Um, so uh, Joseph had his hand up. Yes, Harold make a great point about the difference between the subduction zone and the Benioff type quakes and the crustal quakes. Um, the Olympic Willow liniment quakes along the Seattle Fault and Tacoma Fault um, are shallow and uh, great proximity to urban zones 
And so I think that has great bearing. Perhaps Sarah could um, opine on this, on the relevance of shake alert, because the shallow crustal zone faults are right there. And you'll get fairly little warning. Um, a subduction zone quake, um, Seattle would get good warning, you know, a minute maybe, I don't know. Could I maybe jump in on that? Um, on crustal do. faults, some of them are, are rather long. So if a Seattle fault earthquake initiated, say, at North Bend, Seattle would get some alert, but it would be short. And you're right, if it occurred right under the city and shallow enough, uh, that there would be a late alert zone around the area, you know, for tens of, you know, many kilometers where the P and the S waves arrive too close together to, to send out an alert to alert people that stronger shaking is, is going to come. But for people in Everett, for people in Tacoma, for people in Bremerton, uh, you know, th th those alerts would go out and they would be useful or Olympia. Um, so you're right, if you're very close to a crustal earthquake or right on top of the fault, you, you may be in a late alert zone, but uh, as you move away from that, uh, you, we, we have dense instrumentation in the city and so the alerts go out very quickly. Secondly, for deep earthquakes like Nisqually, uh, as soon as the P wave arrives at the surface, because it's about 35 kilometers deep, the alert goes out uh, within a second or two. So, uh, so for those earthquakes, you can get an alert even if you're right on top of the earthquake. And you're right, a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is likely to provide 30 seconds to perhaps minutes of warning depending on where it initiates and how it propagates. But again, earthquakes, very great earthquakes like uh, the Tohoku earthquake or another Cascadia earthquake will appear to be a magnitude seven when it first initiates. And so the updating of that information as more data becomes available is really key and that's built into shake alert but um but the initial alert may say a seven and alert most of the state because you're likely to feel a magnitude seven in the cascadia subduction zone in most of western washington or oregon depending on where it occurs so that initial alert will go out to a lot of people and then it will expand as we learn that that earthquake is growing Thank you, Bill. You guys rock. <laughs> Thanks. We've got a question from Johanna or Johanna. Johanna. I was just wondering, uh, uh, what is the system of checking on the sensors once they're placed and maintaining them? And, and I'm assuming there's a system where the uh, sensors are, where they're initially planned to be placed. What's, how is that system um, created? Well, um, we've been operating a seismic network for more than 50 years in the region. Um, it was a lot smaller pre-Shake Alert, and we've been adding these stations um, at a really rapid rate in the past few years. So we have over 200 in the state of Washington and well over 400 across Washington and Oregon. Um, so the idea is basically to distribute them so that they are close enough together that several sensors will detect an earthquake close to it as, as the waves are starting to spread from it. Um, and also they're concentrated in the areas where the population is concentrated and they're concentrated in areas where the most, where we think the most likely faults to produce earthquakes are. So what that adds up to is the Puget Sound region has a high concentration for actually both of those reasons. And then the rest of the state, it's a little sparser. There's a lot of stations on the coast and so on. Um, we have an operating budget um, that we keep going uh, to keep all the stations running year after year after year, 24 seven. Um, even during COVID, we had field crews out maintaining things uh, throughout this past year. Um, the UW and U of O actually in partnership with and funded by the US Geological Survey, plus some other partners that help us fund it too, um, uh, keeps that network going. We hope we keep that network going for a very long time. They're the unsung heroes of, of our group. And tune into our website, pnsn.org, on Fridays. And you can, you'll usually get a tweet or a little story for, for our field work Fridays, where you'll get pictures of folks doing work in the field and, and stories about installations. Quick question Will there be another test alert for those of us that missed it? We don't currently have any additional testing planned. 
Um, but when apps and things like that come out in May, uh, we will there will likely be some tests of those, and we'll have more information. Good question. Thank you. I might add that uh, Oregon is planning a test somewhere in the summer, but that wouldn't be applicable to us. But there will be additional <laughs> real tests as WIA tries to improve their system and and uh, and we take a look at how well uh, it can handle shake alert messaging. Well, may, we may have come to the end of our, our questions, which we had so many wonderful ones. And um, I give the last, last opportunity for anybody. Uh, can I just there is a seattleemergencyhub.org network that has hubs all over the greater Seattle area. If you want to know more about that, you should go to seattleemergencyhubs.org. Is there any link between the um, Amber Alert system on our phones versus uh, the Shake Alert? I've got Amber Alert turned off. Would that affect Shake Alert? Mm, potentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, on my phone, there are separate selections. Um, you can you can select uh, Amber Alert on or off and local alerts on or off, but that's, that's... That's one of the things we're trying to learn from this is is to suss out all of those details. But um, so there's certainly there might be interactions. If you turned off Amber Alerts, you may not get any of the, the WIA alert types. So. So the moment we're pretty sure this is the setting it's called public safety alerts that should be the one turned on for yep. uh, see if, we have if you have it on. if you have it on your phone so mm -hmm. it's probably Sarah, <clears throat> Sarah has USGS considered um, developing a you know a app app store app that um, is independent of the cell phone alert messages? I think, you have to ask, have, I think you'd have to ask Bob that question. It's a really good one, but Bob, I'm handing that over to you. What was it? Joseph, what was the question? <laughs> I didn't hear the question, Joseph. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think in LA, they have a, like a app that you download on your phone that's independent of the alert system. Uh, so is that yeah, so well, so, so two parts to that question. First of all, the city of Los Angeles experimented for a few years with their own app. And it was, it was partially just to get the system going and to do some experimentation. So the city of LA has retired their, their app actually as of the beginning of 2021. They felt that they got the industry, this process kickstarted enough um, to, to get things going. Um, and the second part of your question, I think, is that all of the Shakler powered alert, all, all alerting coming through the Shakler system, through apps, through WIA, through automated systems, through Android operating system are all powered by ShakeAlert. So they're all using data from the ShakeAlert system uh, to produce and deliver their alerts. So, and actually that's a really big piece of the puzzle for us is that the USGS has a pretty specific role in this enterprise to detect the earthquakes, to process the information, to make the shake alert messages available. And then we hand them off to our many partners who do all kinds of things with those, those shake alert messages, slow trains, open firehouse doors, send alerts to people that tell them to take protective action. So what a challenge. Has, Good job. Plans. I'm sorry, go ahead, what were you gonna say? Sorry. Um, what a tremendous challenge to interface the science with the uh, technology um, to distribute the data. Um, good job. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'd also like to, you know, give my gratitude to many of the folks like Bill Steele and Sarah and others who are with us, Margaret, uh, Vinci. They are actually the people who are in the trenches finding all of those partners to work with the USGS to use our data to, to do all these wonderful things. So if I haven't, if I left anybody out, Harold, others, um, all are part of this large enterprise to get this done. So... Can I give a little uh, plug? It went through in the chat, but um, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is running a YouTube uh, public lecture tonight at 6.30 p.m. Uh, as a live YouTube premiere. Well, actually, it's a video and then a live Q&A 
on the Nisqually 20th anniversary, and we'll have more chances for people to ask questions uh, for the final half hour of that event. So it's 6.30 to 8 tonight. Look for just PNSN at YouTube, or I put the link in the chat if you copy it in, but um, it, it won't go live till 6.30, but then you'll be able to watch that video. An hour long program with some great history of the Nisqually earthquake and some stuff about Shake Alert as well. If you follow us on Twitter, the link for tonight's presentation is in the pinned tweet at the top of our account. So you can get it right from there. And actually, if you click on it now, you'll see Harold talking about the anniversary of Mount St. Helens. Really? <laughs> yes, Harold. <laughs> not, not anymore, I, th I think that- I think it's right. changed now, yeah. <laughs> that's, hey, that's changed, okay. Well, I, when I clicked on it yesterday, I watched you for about 15 minutes. So even though I talk to you all the time, it's like to watch you on YouTube, so. Well, I wanna thank everybody for participating today. It's been really great to hear all of your feedback and to see all of your faces. And um, we just appreciate the feedback that you've been able to give. And you now we're gonna keep improving this system. So it'll just hopefully our toolbox of earthquake preparedness tools will just continue to get sharper. So everybody go stock up on dried food and don't panic. All right. Thank Good. you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thank Jenny. you very much. Great job, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Thank you. Good job. Everyone.